All right, everybody, thanks for joining me. It is time for another episode of The Nostalgia Trap. I am your host, David Parsons. I appreciate you listening to the show, sharing the show, supporting the show, etc. Um, thanks very much. We have a great guest today. Um, Kate Aronoff is on the program. Very excited to bring you that conversation. Kate and I talk a lot about climate crisis, climate change, what we can do in the face of such tremendous challenge ahead of us. So, you know, this is a tricky thing to talk about. And I, I wanted to share something before we get started that's a, a, a quote that I think um, you know, will help you know, frame a little bit of how I'm thinking about this stuff and how I, I think a lot of us should think about this stuff. The quote is from Glenn Greenwald. I know he's kind of a, a controversial figure on the left. Some people hate him. Some people are uh, really into him. But this, this, I thought this little piece that he wrote about um, the death of Mariel Franco, who was a Brazilian politician, uh, yeah, someone you should look up and know more about. Uh, she was assassinated in, in March, part of the, the the really awful series of events that are unfolding in Brazil right now. But Greenwald wrote this 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 piece, and and this this short part of it, I think, um, goes along well with the stuff that Kate and I talk about in this episode, which is kind of like you know how do we how do we come to terms with something so huge like the climate crisis, uh, like what the, the IPCC report is is telling us? And and Kate has, um, you know, she, she writes about these issues. She has a lot of um, she, has, she has a lot of thoughts about the kind of way we frame the idea of climate change. So um, we'll get to that in a second. But let's read the, the uh, Glenn Greenwald quote from his piece on The Intercept uh, about Mariel Franco. This is, uh, uh, to me, it's about, he's, he's talking about um, Brazilian politics, but I think it, 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 it helps us frame climate change too. So this is him. It says, Powerful factions, as part of their intimidation tactics, deliberately try to breed a sense of collective and personal impotence. You're too small and powerless, and they're too fortified and entrenched for you to meaningfully challenge them. But human beings, all of us, have the power to move the world even a little tiny bit at a time. And the more that happens, the more the world moves in the direction it's pushed. We're trained to think only grandiose, revolutionary overhauls have meaning. But tiny, isolated actions also matter. Convincing a single person to change how they think or behave, helping or saving a single life, being an anonymous, unrecognized part of any campaign or movement. It matters on its own because of its inherent worth and because of its cumulative effect. But so often your actions can reverberate in ways you would never expect. Impotence and hopelessness are a tactic, a lie told by those who wield power to foster resignation, passivity, and acceptance. So that's Glenn Greenwald in The Intercept, again, talking about Brazilian politics. But I think that a lot of what Kate and I did get into in this conversation is the kind of the feelings of powerlessness and even nihilism um, that the media puts you in when they when they they frame the uh, when they frame the, the, the climate change stuff in their doomsday kind of way. And again, you know, we do a lot of doomsday thought on this show. This is a, a kind of apocalyptic show and climate change is part of that. But but, um, uh, w you know, we're also doing something with history on this show, if you've noticed, you know, I'm a historian uh, um, and, and a radical historian. And by that, I mean I, the history. I study the history of, of, of radicals and, you know, from the uh, uh, from the, the labor movement all the way through the anti-war movement, in the 1960s and 70s. We have and all through American history, we have millions of examples of, of people that exactly like a Greenwald is talking about in this quote, which is that, you know, the people that are forgotten by history, but made massive impacts by the small things that they did. So, you know, in, in a lot of ways, that's what I'm trying to do with this podcast is throw the ideas out there and see what happens to them. And I, and, and I think that everyone who listens to this podcast and other podcasts, they're part of a, a larger thing that's happening. And, and all of these voices are important. So, you know, with that in mind, let's listen to me and Kate Aronoff. Um, Kate is a, a, a writer who I, I think you should you should check out. Her work is um, all over the place, but I've seen it most in The Intercept and in these times, uh, Descent Magazine. And her stuff, again, you know, she writes about climate change and she writes about it from a, a really um, intelligent and compelling perspective. So I was really happy to talk to her. I hope you enjoy this conversation. Uh, and if you enjoy what we do, please help uh, support the show. It's really important to us. Um, we're completely listener supported. So if you go to patreon.com slash nostalgia trap, you can become a patron of the show, uh, which means you give us a, a few bucks every month. 
Um, and we give you access to bonus episodes and things like that. But more importantly, you keep the show going uh, and keep these voices growing online. I think the, the podcasts that are out there right now, the best ones are creating a kind of intellectual legacy and an oral history of uh, a really um, transformative moment on the planet. So uh, with that lofty goal in mind, I hope you enjoy this episode. This is me talking with writer Kate Aronoff. Hi, Kate. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. I like your um, avatar picture. Oh, that little <laughs> um, that little <laughs> rock and roll uh, Karl Marx. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't. I found that. I don't. Mean, that's not. I think. I think I found that in like an underground newspaper and scanned it and and then like kind of colored it and turned it into that little icon. So that's that's unique. Uh, you know what's funny is I use it in my Gmail. Like I don't know how to like kind of dislocate it from my Gmail. <laughs> and so, like, I end up sending Karl Marx stuff to everyone, and I don't, uh-huh. I'm not sure if I'm really down with that. <laughs> it's a bald, it's a bald choice. Yeah, well, I mean, it works in certain contexts, but I like, um, I teach at military bases too, so I like <laughs> communicate with people in the military um, <laughs> with my little Karl Marx guy. I think they did. It, it looks like it could be like just some old dude, you know? Yeah, I imagine a lot of people are just a little confused. Yeah. <laughs> So, Kate, thanks so much for joining me. I, you know, I really, um, I really like your writing. I see your stuff everywhere. I see um, your now Kate scaring off on <laughs> on Twitter <laughs> uh, for Halloween. I'm still trying to figure out my Twitter handle, my Halloween Twitter handle. But um, thanks for joining me. I appreciate you talking with me. Yeah, thanks so much for for having me on. I'm a fan of the show. It's been so you 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 write for a number of different different magazines um, and publications, but I I feel like um, is it Descent that is is one that you're really close with? So I am really close with Descent. Uh-huh. Yeah, um, I have written more so for uh, in these times mm-hmm. where yep. I was a writing fellow for the last two years um, up until this past summer. Um, and now for The Intercept, but um, I'm on Descent's editorial board, and actually Descent sort of brought me into the the world of New York journalism, I guess. I mm-hmm. interned for them in 2015, and mm-hmm. so, um, yeah, kind of uh, decided that was where I wanted to do writing. So I feel I feel close to Descent, even if I um, write a little less a, l- a little less frequently for them than for um, some other places. Are, so you're not are you not from New York originally, but you're living there now? No, I'm from uh, South Jersey, but yeah, I live in New York now. South Jersey. So, is that, are you from like? Um, I, I always like to find out if people are from the suburbs. And New Jersey seems like a place where the the suburbs are are a ripe spot. Is that is that kind of describing where you're from, or where where in South Jersey? I haven't really worked out kind of how to describe <laughs> it because I think it's too hard for anything in New Jersey because it's so dense to yeah. be considered like a properly rural, but. Um, I don't. I don't know if it's an exurb or you know how those definitions um, break down. I'm from a town called Millville. Oh yeah, which is mm-hmm. like, you know Millville? No, I've I've heard of it. Um, okay. but no, I don't know it. That is more than yeah. most. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. I mean, there's. I I am shocked because there's not really much of a reason to know. Um, well, I mean, I lived in, in New York for many years, and I feel like I encountered people from Jersey who mentioned towns like that. And Millville is something that I've I've heard of, but I know absolutely nothing about. Got it. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, it's like a small city, mm-hmm. I guess you would call it, mm-hmm. technically, in terms of its uh, governance. And it's about, I think now, around 30,000 30, people mm-hmm. um, up to. And it's called Millville because there were once mills there. Mm. Um, there but not anymore. Still, no, actually, my kind of um, drive to school through most of growing up was like a, this giant sort of decrepit glass factory parts of which were still working but most of which was just kind of like a husk um and so yeah the the town was named for a thing which which mostly no longer exists yeah i'm not native to new york but i lived in new york city for about 15 years and and so i you know i was one of those people that you know didn't have a car and so my my journeys to you know through new jersey and upstate were always kind of noticing the like i don't know uh, post-industrial wreckage like that yeah, 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 it's kind of it's everywhere. A big part I mean, of the I'm, landscape yeah. out there. Yeah, yeah. I mean, maybe maybe a little less so in, in parts of Jersey than um, than you know the kind of like 
proper rust belt, but it's definitely definitely a fixture. I, 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 the reason I ask is that, you know, I, I mean, I teach a lot about um, suburbs and you're, I mean, the definitions are all over the place in terms of like what a suburb is and what a city mm-hmm. is. But it, but it seems like um, I don't know, you, you write a lot about you write a lot about environmental issues and you write a lot about like um, the climate crisis and things like that. And I just kind of wanted to get a grasp on like. I don't know. Was that when? How how did that come to you? Um, in, in other words, how did the the idea of climate crisis or climate change like come to you um, in your youth uh, around you? Was it something that was part of the you know environment around you, or was it more something that you you learned as a as a kind of um, I don't know abstract idea, if that makes sense? Yeah, I mean, I think I think a little more so the latter. I mean, obviously, South Jersey, um, a little bit closer to the coast than where I grew up, mm-hmm. but um, is one of the places that you know has been and will continue to be some of the most um, hit by by climate impacts. But I it was mostly like unaware of all of that growing up. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, I mean, I I kind of came to climate politics. Um, I guess in college. So I uh, was, I, I sort of came to politics generally through um, this like state run summer program mm. um, that the state of New Jersey used to run before I think it became like a victim of, of budget cuts. Um, but uh, it was called the New Jersey Governor's School. And it was like one of these things that you sort of uh, apply for. Um, I think I was a, I was a, it was the summer before my senior year of high school. And so you apply for it and it kind of looks good on your resume and it's, it's somewhat selective. Um, and so I went to this one, they had different themes. There was like one for engineering, one for uh, fine arts, mm-hmm. um, kind of all over the place. I went to one for um, international studies and it happened to um, be run that particular summer by um, some folks who, you know, I identified as anarchists and, um, had been involved with sort of starting up the new, um, the kind of new iteration of Students for a Democratic Society. Um, and they... Uh, that's really, that's not what I expected you to say. <laughs> yeah, I, I yeah. thought you were going to be like, okay, this is like a program, you know, that's run by the state. They're going to be like um, a, a bunch of like neoliberal, like think tank people there. But instead you're, you're like, they're anarchists and they're starting up SDS again. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, it was, it was fun. I mean, and I, it, and they gave these sort of, um, like extended, uh, presentations. I think one was on, um, Marxist thought and what, well, you know, this sounds like kind of a right wing fever dream. If yeah, <laughs> totally. Describe it. It's like, wow, the state is indoctrinating. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Children. It sounds like I, I, I was wrong about Fox news. <laughs> they're, <laughs> they're telling the truth about the indoctrination, but yeah, that's, that's kind of surprising that the anarchists would no, surprising a, that the anarchists would be involved in that program and that that program would like want them. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, both both people, you know, I won't I won't mention them, their names, but um, who you know have uh, are, are um, academics and, and are uh, I think are involved with education in various ways yep. um, beyond their beyond their activism. Um, okay. So it wasn't the most unnatural fit, but um, yeah, it is it is very funny to to think back on. But yeah, I mean, I I think I had been sort of interested in politics before that, and mm-hmm. sort of like a vague like. You know, I was really excited about Obama mm-hmm. and um, yeah. When is it, when Obama. is it, when in time is this happening that you're doing this? What who is is Obama president? That's that's what's happening. Yeah, this yeah. been I graduated from high school in 2010, uh-huh. so this would have been uh, summer of 2009. Right. Yeah, and uh, yeah, I mean, I think more so than anything, like they gave these like presentations about like Marxism and greenwashing and all of this, all this stuff that was like a bit above my head, um, mm-hmm. enough to like, you know, kind of grasp onto, but, um, yeah, I mean, I, so I grew up in this, this town that was, uh, fairly segregated and, um, was pretty, you know, working class, it, like pretty huge, uh, portion of folks I went to school with below the poverty line. Um, and I just always had this sort of big sense, like I grew up very, you know, comfortably middle class, like that there was something sort of, uh, weird about that there's like something just kind of on a on a emotional level it's weird about um like noticing class differential and i think what was helpful about the mm. program and kind of like what they presented it was like oh there's this language to talk about it there's like actually you know words for this not just like this vague kind of weird feeling um 
Yeah, so. that's important. I, what, what, I mean, did you have parents or people around you that were political that were talking about that kind of stuff? I mean, there's I've had a you know I've had a lot of red diaper babies on this program. Like, <laughs> I know, like parents, I, I'm I, I don't know if I'm jealous or not actually of people who were raised by communists. But like, what 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 were the the politics around you growing up, or were there not much politics? Yeah, yeah, I have a I have a similar weird relationship. Um, I'm definitely not a red diaper baby baby. Um, so I mean there it, there were politics growing up in a sense. My um, mom is a retired uh, teacher. She taught for 35 years. Um, I think I'm getting that number right. In uh, in public schools around around where I grew up, um, and so you know had like union politics that mm-hmm. weren't like a special you know she wasn't I don't think she was like a steward or anything um that I know of but was just like had a kind of basic sense that unions are are good um and important oh I remember and, when more people knew that and <laughs> and yeah. understood that I, I wish that I wish that feeling were more pervasive today really yeah it's so there's so much to it um that yeah I think it's it's it, I, I certainly have taken for granted um but uh, but yeah, and, and so my uh, my dad uh, worked as a for the county government um, administering different grants for mental mental health services. So yeah, I mean it wasn't it's not like they were they certainly wouldn't identify as leftists either then or now. Um, but we you know talked about talked about politics, and I think something that like I it took me a while to kind of get a grasp on until a you know, not in, in the last couple of years. Um, it's just that it seemed, it always seems so weird that like, like working in the private sector, just always like, I never quite understood it. <laughs> <Yeah>. um, <laughs> what, do you, what do you mean? Don't, I mean, I feel the same way. Um, but, but what do you mean by that? Like you never quite understood working in the private sector. Well, I just, cause my, my parents had all, both of them, I think for the vast majority of their, of their career had always worked in the public sector, yeah. either, you know, schools or government, um, and they like really thought their work was important and like related to it, you know, not just as a job, but like, this is the thing that I want to be doing. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, to have a kind of, I don't think they would phrase it this way, but like to have a sort of measurable, um, impact on the world. Uh, yeah. and the, yeah. And the idea that like people go to work like to, um, I don't know, like, uh, I, it's hard. I, I don't quite know how to articulate it. But. Yeah, I think I know what you mean, uh, though. It's like the heart of the like progressive idea that like your work is meaningful to everyone else. And I mean, it, it, it kind of I mean, it sounds like liberalism to me, like really, you know, a really kind of powerful and positive vision of what liberalism is supposed to be, I guess. Yeah, yeah, I guess it's just not I'm, I mean, maybe even more than like public or private sector divide. It's just like not really understanding alienated labor. Yeah. Um, yeah. Or like, <laughs> like what, how that happens or that, you know, there's, there's a privilege to that, but, um, I, I think it, yeah, it just always struck me as odd. Well, it's like, I mean, I, I worked, I don't know. It's, 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 it's a, it's a hard, it's actually, it's a hard thing to talk about in a lot of ways because there, you don't want to like demean this idea of like work for work's sake or whatever, or like the people that are, you know, working in jobs where they're like, basically their only purpose of their job is to produce wealth for the ruling class and take their little tiny like waged section of it. Mm-hmm. But, you know, I mean, I used to wait tables when I was young forever, like many, many years. I've told the stories many times of working at like corporate restaurants, like Applebee's, those kind of places. And it was my kind of like reading Noam Chomsky and stuff like that while I was at that <laughs> place that made me like unable to work there. You know what I mean? Like, it yeah, kind of, and yeah. it's a, it sounds like I don't want it sounds condescending. Like I like, oh, I smarted myself out of working at this place. But it wasn't like that. It just felt like I wanted a purpose. I wanted my work to have a purpose. And it felt like slinging these burgers was not a purpose. Um, and, and that that is that's the alienation. It seems like you're talking about. Yeah, and just like a deep sense that like this sucks, you know. <laughs> like, yeah, totally. I, I worked at a deli um, my uh, the summer after my senior year, and then mm-hmm. the summer after my freshman year in college, and it's like, wow, this really is not is is hard yeah. <laughs> in ways that it it shouldn't be. Um, yeah, and it wasn't, and it made me think like, oh, I want to escape this. Um, but it also made me think of all the people that 
for many reasons can't uh, escape that and are working in that and that that I base you know that's that's the for- formation of my politics in a lot of ways you know it's kind of like um thinking about the working class knowing the position they're in knowing how much it does suck I think that's the scientific way of putting it um and and wanting to, to change the society and make make everyone's life more, more meaningful yeah and then part of why it sucked was like I mean the biggest part of why it sucked was not anything like endemic to the nature of like providing sandwiches to, um, <laughs> yeah, to yeah. Fox, but like uh because like our boss was a jerk yep. and the wages were horrible yeah. <laughs> like mm-hmm. that was what was bad about it not you know something kind of i don't know the meaning people find meaning in all sorts of ways yeah but, for sure so uh, you're back to this program with these anarchists and SDS. Um, uh, do you know anything about SDS? Because I know very, I know everything about SDS in the '60s and '70s, which is kind of like the 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 story, of the, v- the Vietnam War and anti-war movement and everything like that. And Weather Underground is such an epic saga. But what is the like modern today SDS like? Do you have any idea? Yeah. So I think it. Um, I mean, I don't know to what extent it still exists, and I think even. By the time that I got to college, it had um, was sort of starting to wane, but I, it came out from my understanding of it um, from mostly college students who were involved in the anti-war movement mm-hmm. and were involved in, um, you know, I think probably the ultra-globalization movement too, um, and to have sort of like a student um, a kind of place for, for those politics on campus. Right. Um, and yeah, and, I, and I, you know, they... This was before before my time, but um, had some pretty huge conferences, from what I understand, um, and brought a lot of a lot of folks together. Um, yeah, it's funny to talk to folks who like kind of mostly people a, a few years older than me, but um, who kind of came came into like activism through uh, new SDS. Yeah, that's I, I didn't realize that. And and so when you're in this program, uh, it sounds like you're kind of like learning a, a little bit about the kind of like language of politics and things like that are they um is your head spinning in this stuff or are you kind of like you know what are what are the things that you're finding are there were there particular i don't know were there particular um i, I mentioned chomsky a lot were there particular pieces of writing or or people or figures that kind of blew your mind during that era yeah i mean i i loved it like i i you know love that kind of stuff mm-hmm. um and still do in, in different <laughs> different forms yeah um, totally i mean i don't know if it was like a particular well i mean there were some things so i read uh howard zinn's people's history of the united states i think was like a very formative totally um formative book after that uh after going to that program M- mostly i remember um just like scrolling for hours and hours and hours through like the <laughs> Wikipedia pages for mm-hmm. Marx and Bakunin, <laughs> and, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. All sort of like thinkers, and you know, watching things like Democracy Now. Um, and... Yeah, that whole world um, is is you know once you find it, you find the usual suspects. And I mean, Howard Zinn is like you know, the people's history of the United States comes up a lot in this um, on this uh, program because it seems like it's like the gateway drug. That's like the, in a lot of ways the the place that people find. Uh, I don't know. It, it's you know a different kind of perspective on the the events that you've been told your whole life. Um, so you know, as as you're moving forward, this is at um, you 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 want to. Is, did you go to Swarthmore? Mm-hmm. You, uh, um, and what was that like in terms of your politics or in terms of p- the political scene there? I know that like Swarthmore has a kind of certain reputation. I know that um, I did some research there with the uh, at the Peace Studies Collection, oh, um, yeah. which yeah. is awesome. Um, but but what were the what are the politics at Swarthmore like, or what were they like when you were there? Yeah, so I mean, I I kind of came in like looking to do some sort of activism um, or organizing. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's a, it's an interesting place. Um, I think it's a lot of folks who sort of enter organizing, you know, not in ways too dissimilar to how I did, mm-hmm. kind of through the lens of ideas. And so people who, like, read um, Marx or Foucault or, like, you know, really sort of, like, postmodern theory um, and enter like activism through that, mm-hmm. um, which I think is, you know, does not provide a sort of total orientation to 
how politics works. Um, <laughs> it was, it, yeah, I, know, to put it lightly, I think. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, uh-huh. yeah, yeah. It was cer- certainly like kind of a learning process um, for me. I mean, it's a, it's, I think it's like, people have written about how, you know, education is like sort of the education system kind of produces like socialism for the rich. And I think Sarthmore is kind of a, a, a place that, <laughs> helps to embody that. I mean, I was able to go because mm, yeah. I got like a tremendous amount of financial aid and took out a lot of debt that I'm still paying off. But, mm-hmm. um, it is just sort of, you know, this very idyllic, like beautiful place where people talk about <laughs> ideas and are very yes. smart. Yes. Um, and you just get to kind of like do that for four years and it's awesome. That's so uh, romantic. That's like, such yeah. a, that's, I mean, in a lot of ways. And, and, you know, I say this as almost like con- as a confession, you know, that, that like, you know, a lot, a lot of that image is what drew me to like wanting to go to grad school and like continue like the life of the mind kind of thing. Um, mm-hmm. and that it's, I mean, it's a fantasy really, <laughs> um, right, right. But but it's nice, yeah, it's a nice fantasy to live in. Totally. And, um, <laughs> fewer and fewer people are able to live that fantasy though, I think. Oh yeah. 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 Um, I mean, I'm paying yeah. dearly for it. <laughs> I mean, yeah, it's, it's an exclusive one. Yeah. I'll be paying for that fantasy for the rest of my life. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah, but it's, I mean, the, it's, it's not, I don't know. It's like, I would like to live in a world in which everyone gets to do that. Yeah, um, totally. Has the option to do it right now. It exists in the confines of this like sixty thousand dollar a year institution that like systematically keeps very large numbers of people out. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. But but yeah, I mean, I, I you know um, I, I really like it. I, I met a lot of folks who were interested in sort of similar things politically. Um, I got I helped start up. Um, this group working on something called fossil fuel divestment, um, looking to get the college to take its uh, holdings out of out of fossil fuel companies. So it's worth uh, more itself. Yeah. 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 yeah that, that, I mean, that 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 kind of tradition is SDS, too, that are of like kind of like, um, I don't know, your, your school being the place that like you you can like touch the politics. And it seems like that's a that's a pretty heavy tradition on the left in colleges, at least, is to like kind of, you know, aim your activism at the campus itself. Right. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I have sort of mixed feelings on it. I mean, definitely, um, I think the kind of like new, I guess it comes out of the new left, right? Like this tendency to sort of like focus on like these institutions as yeah. like a site of struggle. Yeah. Um, I don't know if I'm, I'm, I'm totally convinced that like the political utility of uh, getting like these Mm-hmm. very wealthy private institutions to change their practices. Mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. Um, I do think it's an interesting, it can be sort of like an interesting laboratory for people to kind of work out their politics. And, um, I agree. You know, yeah. Figure out what camp, you know, how to do campaigns and stuff. And um, definitely not like a microcosm for the rest of the world. But, um, but you know, I think there's, there's something to be said for, for student student organizing. Um, yeah. I, I mean, it's weird. And it's also like, I don't know. It, it, it's, it's a more nuanced thing than the ideas we get in the mainstream media about like college activists, right? Like, uh, I yeah. mean, it's like, that's like red meat for the alt right. And they're like, have this vision of it. And I, as a person who like spends most of his time with college students, uh, you know, I'm very defensive about their kind of activism, even when I find it myself kind of precious or whatever, you know, I'm still kind of like defensive of them because I'm like, I, I do view it the way you just said, which is kind of this is an important like laboratory an important like kind of first step in a process of their politicization that, I, you know, I don't see the harm in it. And I actually think that they can they can bring attention to a lot of important issues. Um, but, yeah, at the same time, they can be really obnoxious and like, <laughs> I don't know, misdirected. And I, I, I look at some of the campaigns and I cringe. Um, but at the same time, I'm, I guess I'm more forgiving of it than a lot of the fucking fascists that want to paint them a certain way yeah totally i mean it's like what on earth were all of them doing at age like 19 exactly um yeah i mean i will say that like it's funny to watch i mean horrifying in most ways but um (laughs) like the debates are about you know free speech on college campus oh god yeah the like endless creative uh, op-eds written about it mm-hmm. but like i feel like that really only happens at like i mean maybe not only like but i feel like places like swarthmore are like breeding grounds 
<laughs> oh, totally. <laughs> yeah. It's like, it is just these like, not only, yes. uh, but like, it, I feel like elite colleges in particular, like elite liberal arts colleges are like yep. the sort of like Petri dish where those politics form. And like to say that like that is college students and like that is college life is. Yeah, the, cool. the, the, there almost... is a class element to all of that stuff for sure. I mean, I've taught at um, I've taught at NYU and I've taught at CUNY um, and I've taught at a million working class schools and a million kind of very privileged um private liberal arts colleges and the difference in like kind of activism it's weird there's kind of a privileged activism um yeah. that because the and part of it is because the cuny students honestly are so fucking busy and overworked and like um you know essentially like living living the the real like working class life in new york city that their kind of you know culture and interests and ability to be involved in that sort of stuff is is much more limited well and the folks that i knew who did activism at you know rutgers or cuny or whatever like the fights were not around what they were about at swarthmore they were around yeah. like budget cuts there you go like yeah student debt um, you're right so think, you're you right know, the fights yeah. just seem like a little more the one i mean the one time material. you're right and and i mean the, the 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 one time that i saw cuny students rising up uh, was about tuition increases. Um, yeah. And I mean, there's a YouTube video, literally, this was like the signal event of my time at Brute College was when the, the like, you know, security forces uh, backed by the NYPD came in and, and, and brutalized these students right inside the campus uh, as okay. they were trying to get into the room of the um, where the board of trustees were meeting. And it was just like enormously depressing. Um, but you're right. It was about material stuff. It was about economics. It was about kind of the 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 reality of uh, paying for this uh, this school and understanding that, it, you know, CUNY used to be free and mm -hmm. working, getting tuition increases and that stuff was outrageous. And that was happening right around Occupy, which I wanted to ask you about. Were you around when Occupy was happening? That was 2011. Yeah. 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 Um, I... I mean, obviously, you were alive and around, but I, I was, I got one, you know, <laughs> I don't know, like, what was your intersection with that stuff? Yeah, I mean, really excited. Um, I remember kind of like the lead up to it, like talking to talking to friends about it, and just like wondering what would happen. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, me sort too. of thinking like a lot of people it would be this like silly, like one off thing. Um, yeah, I went into Occupy Philly for the first night and like went in a couple times. After that, Swarthmore is like a twenty minute, twenty minute train ride from Philly. Yeah. Um, and then uh, my biggest sort of engagement with it was um, it, the kind of startup of it coincided with our October break, and mm -hmm. so me and a couple friends um, we went to Occupy Philly, and then we like took a little tour. We went to, I mean, literally we're sort of like Occupy tourists. Um, like went deadheads. To, <laughs> yeah, kind of. Yeah. Went to New York um, and like slept in the park for I think a night or two, and then um, went to DC and did the same thing there. Um, yeah, it was fun. I mean, it was like uh, I mean, I I, th I have a lot of friends who like were actually involved in Occupy in a meaningful way and are still in some ways traumatized by the experience. So <laughs> yeah. I think I got like a, a really nice. Uh, I had a very nice experience with it which was just being kind of excited about it um yeah totally yeah. I, I mean i i was at zuccotti park a lot because i was working for the uh cuny union at the time whose office is like right mm -hmm. above zuccotti park so i went down there all the time and um and it was bizarre i mean it was a bizarre i i, I felt like i it, it was weird the mixture generationally for me like we we're talking about mm -hmm. sds in the 60s and 70s i felt like at occupy like david crosby came down and performed you know and it was like <laughs> there was this like kind of like I, I i felt like is this the end of like this 60s 90s kind of counterculture left or is this the beginning and continuation of it i'm still like kind of unsure but the the, the that moment is is it stuck with it it stuck with us and i know you're like you must you were you were right at the age to be like kind of I don't know it's like it's like a movie almost <laughs> when you think yeah. about kind of like coming out of college and like seeing this happen yeah 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 it did it did feel like yeah I mean maybe like a movie is a good way to describe it, it definitely felt like this thing where I was just you know kind of observing and um you know it, 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 as someone who like got sort of politicized through 
learning about SDS mm, from the 60s yeah. and it's like that. It's like, wow, this is like what it was like. So, I mean, yeah, met, yeah totally. I mean, and tr- I, I've, I've felt that too because I was in graduate school studying the 60s at the time. So it was kind of this bizarre, mm. like cartoonish interpolation of what I was studying <laughs> kind of there on Wall Street. Um, yeah, it, it, it's, 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 you know, and, and people got that involved in that movement um, at a very young age, are now I, I think some of the bigger voices on the left. Um, so it's something, and including yourself, right? I mean, you're someone who's like, this was years ago. Like Occupy Wall Street was seven years ago. Um, God, yeah. Yeah, and you're, I, I see your your writing all over the place. And I, I wanted to ask you, kind of like, you know, how that 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 bridge from, you know, being the, at Swarthmore and being involved in a scene that's kind of like, you know, a, 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 a maybe a, maybe a little bit of a bubble scene of college and that particular set in college. Like, how did you bridge kind of coming out of college and into like the quote unquote, like real world of um, of writing about politics? Yeah, well, I think something that was cool about um, the divestment movement was that you know, we were sort of in touch with a lot of folks who were doing the same campaign elsewhere. Mm -hmm. Um, And so had, you know, was able to, through that, like folks in in, uh, the group that I was in, were able to kind of step outside the bubble in in a sense, and at least, you know, to other college campuses. um, And, you know, start talking to folks and like doing climate organizing and things like that. and so, yeah, so coming out of college, I think, was very sort of aware of the extent to which it, it really was a bubble and was excited to leave. Um, and Had you been writing yeah. in college? Were you already kind of um, thinking about like, being a writer or was writing something that came later? I, for a while, thought I was going to go to grad school. Yeah. Um, I, I thought I was going to get a PhD in history. Mm-hmm. Um but, uh, but yeah, I mean, I had written, obviously, like, for school and, and, and sort of liked that. I mm-hmm. mean, it was a kind of writing intensive program. Um, and then did, through the divestment work, uh, wrote op-eds and, like, press releases and things like that. Um, but was more so sort of excited to, like, write about something else that I wasn't writing kind of like a more, you know, a less academic way. Yeah. Um, about things that I wasn't directly working on. Um, and so kind of knew I wanted to do that. And then the summer after I graduated, this website called Waging Nonviolence had a blogging position open up um, and I applied for that mm. and got it. And so wrote like three posts a week about um, social movements and politics um, yeah, and, and any any kind of matter of things. I think one of the first things I, I wrote was like reviewing Snowpiercer. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know what's funny? Fun. I'm showing that movie next week in my um in one of my I have a, I'm teaching a class on politics and media, so oh, really? we're watching Snowpiercer. Maybe I can find your blog because we're like <laughs> we're looking for stuff to read. There's a Jacobin piece on Snowpiercer that's really good. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I wonder. <laughs> I haven't read that. I haven't read the thing I wrote. And, Probably since I wrote it. <laughs> it wasn't that long ago. It was no piece that came out what a couple years ago? Yeah, twenty fourteen. Yeah. Um, that I mean, speaking of Snowpiercer, I mean, it's a kind of a movie about like you know uh, apocalyptic climate change. I mean, it, 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 at what point is climate change become like uh, your your focus? I mean, I mean, is it your focus? And and why it does, is has it become kind of the thing that you write about the most? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it became my focus through doing organizing around it um, in college. Uh-huh. And uh, yeah, I mean, I, it's funny because I like never, I think a lot of people come into like doing sort of like environmental or climate work, whether that's like organizing or writing um, through having some sort of like meaningful experience with nature or like, you know, <laughs> yeah. having like gone <laughs> yeah. camping a lot growing up or, or something like that. Or being um, a hippie. In some yeah. way, right? Having yeah, that, yeah. yeah, totally. And I just am very deeply like not, <laughs> not, not a, a hippie. Um, not a nature person. Not a tree hugger. No, no, no. Um, so really why, don't feel so, very well in nature. So, so climate change um, is something else for you. Yeah, I mean, sort of, sort of how I, I beyond like the the summer program, um, we I was part of this trip that got organized my freshman year of college. Um, down to West Virginia to meet with folks who were 
resisting mountaintop removal coal mining. Mm -hmm. Um, And that was, I think, what what kind of hooked me in doing um, kind of environmental stuff. Because it's just so, it's like so clear. Yeah. uh, Just like the political economy of Appalachia is like, I mean, that part of Appalachia is just so intense. And that, you know, it's just uh, impossible to sort of like. Miss it. Yeah. (laughs) you know source politics from labor politics Uh, yeah yeah yeah. Um, and so i think that like kind of crystallized oh well you know this these are really um these are really the same thing um and i think it was kind of like through just like learning a bit more about climate stuff not from a super scientific lens but you know talking to folks like that who are kind of resisting extraction um and just kind of being generally aware of like climate politics. And mm-hmm. that's what, uh, how I became a socialist, honestly. Um, yeah. Yeah. That's what I, that, I think that's what I was kind of getting at. Like, I, I mean, for me, like the Naomi Klein was a real big voice for me and she's not, I mean, she's not really a hippie kind of person. She's approaching climate no. change as like this kind of, um, you know, it's a climate change is a container for understanding how much capitalism fucks over the people and the planet. Right. Yeah, no, yeah. totally. And, and I think that's it. I, in part, just like looking at the actual problem and seeing the sort of scale of it, um, it's really hard to not see the solution to that as a incredibly massive transformation of our political economy. I mean, right. like the science has become more clear in the past several years about that. But um, I think, well, you know, Naomi's work is very helpful um, for kind of. Uh, as an orientation to that. Totally, yeah. I mean, I I don't think I've, I don't know if I've actually even seen like Al Gore's like Inconvenient Truth movie. Like, did you, (laughs) I I don't know if I've seen that one. I think I might have seen the Leonardo DiCaprio one, (laughs) like of all these like celebrity documentaries. But honestly, it was like um, the work of, um, yeah, the work of Naomi Klein and a, a few others, I think that kind of attached it more, attached the idea of climate change much more compellingly to the idea of capitalism uh, um, and, and, and then kind of showing us how kind of transforming the way we do everything is the way to address climate change. Right, right. Yeah, and it's not avoidable. I mean, I think to be sort of properly materialist in 2018 is to, you know, think about how climate is going to impact literally every policy field in the next, you know, forever. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we talk about a lot on the show that it's like Amer- Americans, you know, experience something, a lot of Americans, depending on where they are, obviously, uh, you know, experience that kind of cl- thing that we might call like climate privilege, you know, the idea of, of like, you know, the, the, the worst elements of it aren't going to hit us, but they're going to hit us in ways that aren't necessarily climate related. So like, you know, it might be the politics of, um, you know, immigration is the way that we, we experience mm-hmm. it and the politics of um you know, a whole lot of other things that are going to be that are going to be kind of set off um, by the by this crisis. And I think it's I mean, do you use the term climate change or climate crisis? Is there like another way to kind of like phrase what's happening? I, I was saying this to someone recently, but I, 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 I think there are really intense debates about like the politics of each of those phrases. Yeah. I tend to use all of them just because when you write about climate politics, it is really helpful to have a set of interchangeable phrases. Yeah, so yeah, I think I there understand. are like political merits to to break down. I mean, climate crisis is probably the best, the best, you know, most politically kosher way to talk about it. Well, I mean, what do you think? I mean, we're, we're in the shadow of this like IPCC report, right? Like the inter, inter, interplanetary panel on climate change that was a very like, um, you know, dire prophecies about the state of intergovernmental. <laughs> inter, it was intergovernmental, <laughs> not interplanetary. Yeah. Um, inter- we can <laughs> hope. We can hope. <laughs> uh, we're not there yet. I mean, part of it, I, one of my hobby horses is like, you know, aliens and <laughs> hoping that uh, I, I think that the, the me being an aliens is an expression of kind of like um that it's it's difficult to imagine uh, this transformation taking place, you know, um, in this quickly without intervention of like aliens or something like that. Because it seems mm-hmm. like, do you, does it feel that way to you that like when you see the IPCC? I mean, because the, what it was thrown around on, and it seems like like irony Twitter or whatever, just kind of like everyone kind of took that report as kind of like, well, we're all dead in twenty years, ha ha ha. Oh, and it's kind of bizarre, <laughs> right? Like I don't know what to do about that. Yeah, I mean, the, I think irony is dead. <laughs> it's like really <laughs> frustrating to see like people relating this sort of like hand wavy way um, to climate change. I mean, I think part of it is just the way that that 
report in particular, and I think to a certain extent, climate change more generally gets talked about, which yeah. is like the, you know, I don't know if it's editors or whatever sort of grasp onto the most kind of like doomsday framing. Yes. Um, because the actual report says nothing in of the order that like we have twelve years or we're gonna die, mm-hmm. uh, and it, there isn't like a climate scientist on Earth who would who would say we're all gonna die in twelve years. Um, and yeah, I mean, I th- I think it's it's part of why it's so frustrating is just because there's not like there's no engagement there, right? Like there's no sort of like. Um, will to understand well what is this problem actually it's just like you read a headline and um, then turn off from it which is kind of like the laziest sort of thinking um, I can imagine and sort of the real it's so far removed from the actual reality of the problem which is that you know the report itself says um, that this is physically possible that Mm. within the bounds of physics and chemistry there's no reason why we can't do it do this the problem is entirely political and mm. it's a you know it, it's a result the reason it looks so hard is because of the sort of choices that have been made at very high levels about you know how our economy is structured um and so this is like a fight that is very very deeply about that it's about you know who uh really about who gets to live um, yeah. in, in in the 21st century um and and it's not you know climate change itself is like not really an issue it's just mm. sort of condition mm-hmm. um, yeah that affects everything and so i think you know to to hear folks on the left kind of like hand wave about like environmentalism is just sort of like privileged thing a ignores the fact that you know there are folks who have been the reason the whole the 1.5 report got produced in the first place was because like folks in the global south were adamant about the fact that 1.5 degrees is, is a sort of bare minimum for survival mm, yeah for instance um and so it's clearly not a, a privileged issue or whatever, or whatever i understand where that like well i just notion. i guess i think i mean like um there's a separation right like for a lot of people these issues are things they see on tv and i mean it's, it's kind of it's very close to um it's very close to the way Americans experience war, right? It's kind of like almost mm-hmm. like a choice to engage in it or not. And that's a really disturbing thought. Right, right. And like the thing about war is that like we have sort of a cultural memory of an anti-war movement. Yeah. And it's like a thing that we know, you know, has existed for a long time. Um, and so there's uh, on the left, there's kind of like a developed politics around it. It's like a baseline, even if, you know, obviously the, the anti-war left is not in a terrific place right now. But climate change like public consciousness around climate change came at the sort of zenith of the neoliberal era and so um the way that our kind of responses to it and the way we talk about it develop was kind of filtered through um this really awful like third way individualistic lens Mm. um and it's been hard to sort of you know come back from that i think naomi klein calls it a historically case of historically bad timing um mm, yeah in that you know this this crisis which is like so massive is just bound up in every sector of the global economy mm. um because of you know i think in large part because of when when it sort of came into um into the public imagination has been like talked about as the product of these like individual choices that, that all of us have collectively made um, yeah, together yeah. to like be wasteful. Um, when it's just, yeah. Or I use mean, straws or whatever. Mm-hmm. You know. Straws, plastic bags, whatever. Yeah. I, I, um, the other day I was at a restaurant and the guy brought um, like water over and he said, straw or no straw. He's like a surfer dude. I'm in California. So <laughs> he was like, straw or no straw, bro. And I was like, oh, and you know, I was, I didn't even think about it. I just didn't want one. You know, it's like no straw. And he was like, all right, way to contribute. And oh like, my God. <laughs> yeah, oh my God is right. Like that's how I felt. But it was kind of like, that's a per- weird that that would be such a kind of pervasive thing that this kind of like surfer bro waiter had, had had internalized the idea that like to contribute to, you know, the earth, we j- I just don't use a straw, which seems like a really, you know, myopic lens on climate change when it's the really the structure of our society and particularly the structure of industry that's really the problem. 
Right. And it's like saying that you're going to like solve wealth inequality by being nice to a poor person. <laughs> <laughs> I, but I do, I do try to be nice to poor people because I do want to. I, I do uh, yeah, too. Yeah. I mean, that's, you are a sociopath. That's crazy. It's just though. mean to poor people, but, but the, yeah, uh, that, that perform that kind of, that's, that's the kind of, you know, performative liberalism that is just going nowhere. Right. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Do you feel like you're, I mean, I, I say this, I, this is such like a stupid thing to say, but like, you know, your generation, you know, this quote, quote unquote, like millennial young people thing. We hear all sorts of, there. Uh, millennials are uh, like this disgust, like monolithic topic in the media, right? Like uh, whether mm -hmm. it be like kind of addressing millennials as entitled and lazy um, or seeing millennials as part of this kind of like Marxist socialist thing that's happening. Do any of those do any of those images square with like your experience of being around young people and particularly talking about politics in the last several years? Yeah, I mean, I think I exist in as much of a bubble as, <laughs> as anyone can. Yeah, All of my well, you're in Brooklyn, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I, I mean, all of my friends voted for Bernie Sanders. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, I, th I mean, I think there's something to that, like, I mean, the, num the numbers on it seem pretty clear, right? Like, uh, young what, people, the millennial socialist thing? Yeah. yeah. I mean, young people, like, are have no, like, affinity for capitalism, uh, think socialism is cool. Like, 50,000 mm -hmm. people joined DSA, mm -hmm. um, and a vast majority of them are young. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think it's true. And, I, I mean, that's, like, very, from the perspective of climate, it's, it's really hopeful. I think. And it's cool to yeah. see also, um, I think there is like a, a I've been really excited to see um, people like Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and mm -hmm. Rashida Tlaib and other politicians really like being able to just more organically like talk about climate change in particular as mm -hmm. like this part of a much broader set of politics, which is like saying, right, that like, um, the government has a basic responsibility to provide a decent quality of life to the people who live in it. Mm -hmm. Part of that is like making sure there's a roof over their heads. Part of it is making sure you can put food on the table. And the part of it is like making sure there's a livable planet. And so I think seeing, seeing people sort of are increasingly articulating that, um, is really great. And I think it's like, what's going to, you know, help us navigate out of this crisis, hopefully. Yeah. I mean, it, it gives me hope to see that. And I, I, um, I, I feel like that whenever I see, um, any, any movement left from the mainstream it, it, of what the democratic party is, especially it's a good thing. I, I always worry about what the democratic party is going to do to those people once they get, um, once they get to Washington, once they get into their, um, positions, but, yeah, I mean, the, the 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 millennial socialist thing um, definitely gives me gives me some idea of hope. I was I was I was I wanted to ask you about the kind of larger picture of environmentalism because, like, I don't know when I was when I was coming up in the '90s um, in college, like environmentalism was much more of a hippie thing, like the way you describe mm -hmm. it. Like it was like the hacky sack guys, and there was like kind of like um, even that like a you've heard of like the earth liberation front and yeah, like, yeah. you know, a lot of like, um, you know, anarcho syndicalists and, 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 and really like anti-industrialists, almost like ver verging on like anarcho primitivists, like oh, uh, totally. the yeah. Unabomber or something like that, you know, mm -hmm. like basically like we got to draw down the society totally. Um, we, we can't use cars anymore. I I've, I've mentioned this before. Like, I, I really treasure this. I, I don't know if I still have it, this like pamphlet from some environmental group at, at my college that was about cars. And it was like, just described cars as these like, um, as this like Holocaust of, uh, um, of animals <laughs> being run God. over, uh, every year. Like it had statistics about animals being killed. Um, it had statistics about, um, you know, basically the entire automobile industry. And I was really like, wow, this is amazing. You know, like I'd never really thought about this before. Cause I was 18 when I was reading it. Um, but what do you think about all that? Cause there is a kind of debate on the left about like the kind of degrowth versus accelerationism or whatever. Mm -hmm. Like, do we need to like, part of me like still is that guy that was like sitting on the beach, you know, and looking out at the, um, oil piers and being like, we shouldn't do that to the earth, man. It's going to like, <laughs> it's like wrong. Um, but I don't know if you're a socialist, I, I think feel like socialists really believe in industrial society, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think this is why like whatever, um, I mean, I'm a I'm a socialist, and I think whatever like iteration of socialism ends up developing in the U.S. has to look very, very different than um, 
what it has in the past, which, yeah. like you said, has been premised on like huge, like fossil fuel driven yeah. um, economic production. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I like, I think it's tough to talk about degrow mm-hmm. yeah. for people who have not been allowed to consume enough, right? Because of mm-hmm. basic argument, like this is, I think it, this is kind of a caricature and I want to, you know, there are a lot of degrow thinkers I think are totally right about a lot of stuff. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's a, it's a tricky landscape to me. I mean, I, I, that's why I kind of ask because I know it's, I know it's a, a hard kind of, uh, it's yeah. hard territory to navigate because I don't think there's one answer. Yeah. 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 I mean, and I, I think, um, I don't, I think there are parts of degrowth which really are helpful in a kind of analytic mm-hmm. sense. Mm-hmm. I think politically it's really not a great message because there's a basic like unfairness built into that. Right. Like if, if you are like most, most people, um, are not like extraordinarily wealthy and, and, um, you know, deal with some sort of like financial hardship, then hearing that like you are the problem, um, doesn't, may not be the thing that resonates. I think this comes up in like debates around carbon taxes, right? Yeah. And, like, why do I have to pay for this? Yeah. I, and this is why uh, Jimmy Carter's, uh, Malay's speech failed. Because he was like, <laughs> it was like the energy crisis thing in 1979. And he was like, look, Americans, you got to like stop like, um, you know, using so much air conditioning and drive around so much and maybe we should like draw down our lifestyle. And like America right. and Americans right. were like, fuck that. And Reagan came in a year later and was like, that's a, an absurd idea. Like Americans like inherited the earth. We get whatever the fuck we want. And that was mm-hmm. a much more, um, you know, politically winning message, which is another like, uh, disturbing element of like consumer lifestyle. Because it's like, well, once people have it, they're not going to go backwards. Right, right. Yeah. And I think it's, you know, I think that's like the kind of ground that um, any sort of climate movement or socialist movement more generally has to sort of contest on is to say like, no, everybody deserves a really good quality of life. Mm, like mm-hmm. it's not, this isn't like an issue of sacrifice, right? Like this is about giving, making everybody li- everybody's life better, hopefully. I mean, unless you're like an Exxon executive, in which case, you know, you should be sent to the Hague. But, <laughs> uh, <laughs> yes. Um, but for, you know, the any world in which we manage to keep uh, warming at either 1.5 or 2 degrees is a world in which more people enjoy a better quality of life. Like, mm. th- I mean, that's there are, you know, modeling scenarios coming out which say that. Um, and it's just sort of like a, a basic reality is that uh if you displace the sort of most powerful industry in the world, like that yields a very different economy. And I think a a, a much more egalitarian one. And I think it's not to say that like any sort of low carbon future will automatically be egalitarian or democratic, but I think it's very hard to imagine um, the people sort of pushing for a incrementalist status quo approach Mm. Um, to climate change that doesn't sort of um, come into massive conflict with the fossil fuel industry that doesn't sort of come up against industry um, that that'll work like yeah. it's just hard like you like the IPCC report is very clear like fossil fuels need to remain underground and so like uh, that's it we have to find another fuel source to really keep this machine running right yes yeah. yes and you know and, and I think part of it which is like complicated to talk about right is that like it's not as if we're just going to like suddenly run all of the productive regimes that we're a part of on solar or wind. Like there will be actual changes in the way we live our lives. Like we probably like should be eating a lot less meat, right? And taking fewer um, plane rides and things like that. But uh-huh. that's not to say that like that, ha- that's a, worse quality of life like we'll consume fewer widgets right like we'll buy less <laughs> right. useless shit from right. target yeah um, but um i don't like that's not the stuff that makes me happy necessarily right yeah, like yeah i mean i mean you're just, you you are describing the kind of drawing down that i think is is something that we could we could actually do is is kind of like I don't know. That's that '90s Fight Club stuff about like you know the, the all the useless consumer stuff we have, mm-hmm. um, and how we could like engineer um, a consumer reality that's um, 
I don't know, a lot more, a lot more fulfilling and, and answerable to human needs and our imaginations. And yeah, when you think, when you put it that way, like buying useless shit from Target, I mean, that's, I do that all the time <laughs> and, it, and it's not, um, it's not making my life better. And I know that's killing the earth, right? Right, right. I mean, I do, I do it too. Um, and I, you know, I think when we talk about like drawing down or sacrifice, it's like, we can also think about drawing down the work week, right? Like yeah. if we're producing less useless shit, then people can like work fewer shitty jobs. Um, so we don't have to go back to like cavemen, you know what I mean? Like the, we can, there's a, there's a, there's a kind of line, there, there's a balance, there's a space between our like ridiculous, like fossil fuel, uh, pumped out industrial reality and like anarcho primitivism. Totally. And I think it's a, it's a much better world. Like yeah. I think the world in which we like, you know, work for 20 hours a week and spend the rest of our time hanging out in parks and like public beaches. Mm-hmm. Um, it's certainly like a, a, a lovelier world than, than what we have now. Yeah, no, it's a, it's, it's a beautiful vision and I, I, I'm, I'm not entirely sure how we get there. Um, but it feels like, you know, I, I mean, there are people that feel like Elon Musk is going to, you know, invent something, <laughs> um, that's going to like, so, I, I don't know. I, I feel like that, you know, that, the way that, you know, you talked about how the New York Times framed the IPCC report and the way they kind of like have that, the media kind of takes on that doomsday thing. I mean, that that that's a big part of, I, I feel like, uh, and I think you probably agree, to like, like fueling the kind of nihilism, um, mm-hmm. but also maybe the like feeling that like, I don't know, there's a narrative element of this. We've watched so many apocalyptic movies, etc., that like there's going to be an Elon Musk figure or some dramatic development. Uh, but it seems like the dramatic development is going to have to be like literally us building another society, right? Right, right. Or on top of the one we got. Yeah. Yeah, and I and I you know, there's debates about like do we have to destroy capitalism in order to like save the planet. And I actually don't think that. Like mm. I think <laughs> we're not going to like um I don't think capitalism is like the long-term solution, but it is really the economy we live in and I think it's very hard to imagine creating a uh, socialist like worker on system of production within the next decade um, that we'll, can we'll need produce. weapons if we're going to do that that quickly I think <laughs> yeah and I don't I don't you know I don't sort of trust my my friends on the left <laughs> right <my> revolution. <laughs> no if the left um, go, if the left went to war that way um, we're, we're, we're gonna we're gonna get our asses kicked oh yeah yeah totally but um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm sorry I keep throwing out these like, ri- you know, ridiculous scenarios. Part of me is just because I, part of it is just because I, I have a hard time imagining how fast this transition has to go and how mm-hmm. we can do it. Yeah. And, and you're not you're not alone <laughs> in that <laughs> it is it is like a really sort of unfathomable um, yeah. thing. But I mean, the thing that I, I kind of take comfort in is that we've done that before. Right. Like mm-hmm. the United States has done the United States in, in particular and and um other places that I, I know a little bit less about um, have done things that seem like totally unthinkable. There's these great stories from like the start of the depression where like Herbert Hoover is just like beside himself trying to figure out what to do about yeah, the depression yeah. because there wasn't a welfare state. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, all of the, all of the like poor relief ran through like churches and private charities. And so he was just trying to like coax people to like give more to charity and like, uh, convene these like tables of businessmen. That's right. Yep. <laughs> uh, but it sounds like it's like to read that stuff is absurd now, right? Yeah. Because like, um, you know, it just seems so sort of out of touch. And so what, what ended up happening was like this thing that we didn't really have like an experience of, which was creating like a massive system of state provisioned aid, yeah. um, to lift people out of abject poverty. Um, and like, you know, we we've done that before. Like we know how to do things that seem unthinkable. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, we ended slavery. Right. Like, yeah. No, I'm glad I'm glad you brought up. I mean, I'm an American historian. So I'm like, I'm glad I'm glad you brought up those 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 moments, because I mean, civil war. I mean, I mean, obviously, we ended slavery. Six hundred thousand people died in the process of that. But, right? um, you know, abolitionism, uh, you know, this kind of I, it reminds me of um 
uh, Angela Davis, you know, who who writes about uh, prison abolition. And, and mm-hmm. she, she has the same attitude, which is kind of like, look, there are moments in American history that you can point to and be like, look, you know, before these transformations happen, you know, most people would have said they would be impossible, uh, but they happened really quickly. Um, but they, they happened because there were coalitions of people that were organized. And I think that that's something that we're going to have to think a lot about is look, looking back to those movements and seeing what was successful and what wasn't. Yeah, and I think, I mean, something, maybe this is a little too in the weeds, but I think something else is like, it's movements pushing the state to learn new tricks. Mm, Um, mm -hmm. And like, you know, we didn't have a conception of an America without slavery. Uh, And, and, you know, what part of like, the reality of how that happened was like, the government came in, and like, enforced black folks right to vote. Um, Mm -hmm. after, after slavery is abolished. And so like, you know, the state can learn new tricks. Um, yeah. And the uh, new tricks the state usually learns are tricks that are taught it by the ruling class, new, new tricks of, uh, oppression, et cetera. Um, and that's been the story for a long time. And then, and that's why, like, I can never forgive, you know, neoliberals or whatever you want to call them for kind of playing ball with that whole idea because they've given, you know, the public's what things that ought to be controlled by the public and given them to, um, the ruling class has been kind of used the state as their as their handmaiden for a long time right right and and i think this is the other thing i mean it's hard to imagine um part of why it's so hard to imagine a transition away from fossil fuels is because uh i think there's this idea which is prominent even on parts of the left which is that they're you know the state has drawn back the state is like smaller than it was and we have a smaller government mm. um or should have a smaller government but the state you know, intervenes in all sorts of ways on behalf of the fossil fuel industry. Um, and, you know, I think... I they don't they wage go, like, a genocidal wars in the Middle East for the fossil fuel industry. Totally, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, and, you know, from that to fossil fuel subsidies to, you know, going back, like, centuries even to clearing, uh, to, like, building railroads and, and, you know, clearing land and things like that. There are mm-hmm. all these yeah. sorts of ways in which the, the fossil fuel industry is totally, totally dependent on governments um and so it's not that we're sort of creating a system to like incentivize energy production from scratch Uh, we already do that just Mm -hmm. toward a really horrible end yeah and i mean i i don't remember the numbers but i remember that you know um that everyone kind of laughed at bernie sanders for suggesting you know a, a free college education um, and, and even, you know, Hillary Clinton was, 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 you know, laughing at the idea and saying it would never happen is utopic idea. And the idea is mm-hmm. like, where would the government ever get the money for that kind of thing? Right. Um, <laughs> but it, it was like, we spend that much in Afghanistan, like a month or something like that. Um, right. it, it was like, right. just, the statistic was unbelievable. Um, you know, the trillions of dollars poured into war policies that do nothing but make the world a, 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 a more terrible place. Um, instead of, you know, using those funds and that, and that's, that's exactly what we started out talking about was kind of like, you know, we have the resources, it's politics that are blocking us. Right. Right. And I mean, especially in the place like the United States, we have, I mean, like, 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 or yeah, I, I'm forgetting the exact terms, but like the U S has basically unlimited resources to spend money. Yes. Um, <laughs> yep. Yeah. And that's not a hard concept to understand. Mm-hmm. And that's a, you know, that's not true for everywhere like mm-hmm. there, there are places in which sovereign debt is a concern um it's not <laughs> in yeah. the u.s it's yeah. simply you know it's, it's not um and so you know it's it's mind-boggling that it's it's still seen as sort of unfathomable to do this increasingly less so i think there's proposals like a green new deal that are on the table which mm-hmm. i think start to get at the sort of scale scale of the transition but um but yeah i mean there's just no reason why we why we can't you know go go full speed ahead to a low carbon future yeah no i agree it's uh, gonna be i think you know the fight of our generation in a lot of ways and we'll see how it how it pans out um but kate thanks so much for for joining me i really appreciate you talking with me yeah yeah this is great Okay, I hope you enjoyed that conversation. Uh, We want to thank my guest, Kate Aronoff. Uh, I had a great time talking with her, um, and you should go check out all her stuff uh, at Intercept and Descent and other places she's writing. Um, Really, really important uh, stuff that she's bringing to the table. Um, Thanks again for listening to the show. If you can support us at all, it matters a lot. Go to patreon.com slash nostalgia trap, and you can become a nostalgia trap 
patron, part of the club that's keeping this podcast alive. Thanks so much. As always, uh, we'll see you again. Take care. Bye-bye.